We'll look here in the scripture here tonight in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2 and I want to read a verse of scripture tonight that we'll start with this evening. Um, we believe and I believe and you believe I'm sure uh, that the Bible is the word of God and it is alive. It's alive. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 said it's quick. That means alive, powerful. The word of God is living. And it speaks life. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto thee, they are spirit and they are life. So we'll start reading tonight with 2 Timothy 2.9. 2 and verse 9. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. But the word of God is not bound. For Fifteen years I've wanted to do what I'm going to do tonight. And I never had the nerve or the confidence to do it. And I want to preach on that subject. The Word of God is not bound. Now let me say tonight as I preach about this subject, nobody has it all figured out. The, the Bible is boundless in its scope. It is limitless in its understanding. You can't comprehend all of it. It goes out in the beyond. It transcends time. It transcends uh, cultures and trends and fads and habits of people. It is a lie. I will attempt tonight by the help of the Lord to illustrate what that verse is saying. Now, we are, I don't believe you, uh, you, no scripture is any private interpretation. Nobody has the right to take a verse out of here and say, oh, that sounds like that car wreck I've seen, so that's what it meant. I'm not doing that tonight. Uh, nobody, uh, that's private interpretation. Anytime you apply a Bible verse to a situation, uh, you, you better make sure you're not contradicting other verses of scripture. Uh, as you've heard me say, most verses in the Bible have three meanings. There's a literal meaning, like a well, a tree, whatever it's talking about. There is a spiritual meaning, teaching a spiritual truth that we should live by. And there is a prophetic meaning, meaning that means something that's even come in the future. And that's all the way through the Bible. Don't ever make the mistake of thinking the Bible only has one primary meaning in a verse of Scripture. And don't ever make the mistake that God wrote the Bible just for 21st century America. Uh, the Bible is uh, for people way back yonder in the days of old and will be days after we're gone uh, before when the Lord comes back. And so we're, we're taking that in modern day uh, understanding tonight. Correct. And here's what I want to do. I want to show you something in your Bible tonight, and I want you to listen to this, and I hope it'll, it'll help you, and I hope it comes out right. So it's like this. Sometimes them old-time country preachers would get up and preach stuff, and they had prayed, and they had studied, and, they'd, and God blessed what they preached. And as days went by, it was found out that what they were saying wasn't really the right meaning of that scripture. But lo and behold, it turned out to be right anyway because their heart and their motive and their heart was right with God. You ready to start with that? I am not saying the Bible is a magic book. It's not a magic, it's a supernatural book. It's not a spiritual Ouija board. You don't take the Bible and say, all right, God, what do you want me to do today? What do you want me to do today? Boom! You know, uh, you'll do like the guy that did that, you know, and he said, uh, Lord, show me what your will is for me. And he went, boom, and he said, Judas went out and hanged himself. Oh, 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 he said, uh, I, I better not. He said, Lord, uh, let's do, let's, I, I'm going to try it again. Right, maybe that wasn't you. I'm going to try it again. And he said, Lord, show me what your will is. And he went, boom, and he said, go thou and do likewise. <laughs> No, no, don't do that, Lord, no, no. And uh, he said, let's try it one more time, Lord. That wasn't the will of God. And he goes like it. He said, oh, what thou doest, do quickly. He closed it in there. 
Uh, you, that, you don't play with your Bible. It's not a, a, a spiritual punch board uh, trying to find out little answers like a Ouija board trying to find out yes and no's. And so I'm not doing that at all tonight. Here's what I am doing. Take your Bible and turn to Matthew 25. Matthew chapter 25, and we'll, that'll be our first illustration tonight. And if you don't stay with me now, you're not going to get this. So Matthew chapter number 25. There's a story here, a parable actually, that the Lord Jesus Christ gave. And it begins in Matthew 25 and verse 15. It is the parable of the talents. And this uh, man gave his servants talents, and he went off into a far country. And when he came back, uh, some of them he gave more talents, some of them he took their talent away from them, gave it to other people, and so forth and so on. Look at verse 15, Matthew 25, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, 25 and verse number 15. You see it? And, what, and he gave one, he gave five talents to another two, and another one to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Look at verse 20. And so he that received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliver me five talents, I have gained beside them five talents more. Look at verse 25. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth, and there thou hast that thine is. Look at verse number 28. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. Now what happened was for hundreds of years, old preachers in the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, even up into the 1900s, I've heard them do it myself. How many of you have ever heard them old timers and they'd get up and they'd say, if God has given you a talent and you don't use it, he'll take it away from you. How many of you ever heard that? You've heard that preached, you've heard that quoted, you've heard that, and, uh, and uh, we've heard that all of our life. If God's give you ability to sing, if God's give you the ability to uh, uh, maybe to uh, uh, teach or, or uh, whatever, any, any talent, he might have given you some ability that he's given you, and you don't, you know, now that's where that come from, that story right, right there. And the old preachers thought, uh, that, that uh, uh, if you maybe you could sing, maybe you could play piano, maybe you could, but if you didn't use that, and, and they used to preach it, but it scared people to death. And I mean, I mean, there were stories. They literally told stories of people who used to play the piano and they quit playing, said, I ain't playing no more for God, got all their fingers broke and car wreck or something. You know, just crazy stuff like that. You hear about that, and they really preached it. And they're like, well, I'm gonna play, I'm gonna play. Uh, uh, you know, like that. Now, and then we find out that the word talent actually was a amount of money. How many of you know that? Raise your hand, please, in the Bible. If you read the Bible much, you know that? It was actually money that the Lord was talking about here. And a, a, a talent in biblical days could represent up to 15 to 20 years in salary. Over a million and a half dollars that if he gave a talent of money to somebody. So when these people got this talent, he said, you use your talent, right? I'm going to give you more talent. You, you hid yours in the ground. I'm going to take it away from you and give it to the man that used him. So which way is right? And the answer is both. Because the modern definition of talent, like we believe, play guitar, have a musical talent, have some kind of ability. The modern definition of talent comes from a 13th century word and they got it, lo and behold, from this story. So it turns out the old country preachers was right after all. And if God did give you a talent, meaning a physical ability, he wants you to use it for him or you could lose it or he could take and give it to somebody else. The Word of God is not bound. Let's move along. Take your Bible and turn to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter number 2. Amazing scripture here. In Mark chapter 2, and then I want to look at Luke 19. So get Luke 19 in your other hand there and be holding on to it. Luke chapter number 19. Here in Mark chapter 2, the Bible said, verse 2, straightway many were gathered together 
in so much that there was no room to receive them. People couldn't even get in. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. Look at verse number, uh, number four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. Chapter 19. Look at chapter, uh, Luke, Luke, chapter 19. The book of Luke, chapter number 19. Now the Bible said there in Mark that they come to the Lord and there were so, so many people there that they could not get near him. They couldn't get near him for the crowd of people. Watch it. Here it is in Luke chapter number 19. And look at here in verse 3. This is Zacchaeus. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press. There's that word again. The press. Because he was little of stature. Now, in the Bible, the word press meant a great big crowd of people. They were just pressed up against each other. It'd be like a thousand people in this room right here and I'm trying to get over there in my office. I couldn't get over there for the press. And then there's the wine press in the Bible. That press smashed the grapes and made the juice come out of it. And both those places, both those places say that people could not get to Jesus because of the press. So now in modern day, we change the meaning of the word press. When somebody says the press now, you don't think of a crowd of people. What do you think of? The media. You think of the media. Press. And you know where that comes from? The, printing, the press, the printing press, printing newspapers and stuff like that. And so when we preach, well, in the modern day, lo and behold, it turns out right. The press is between you and Jesus. You can't see Jesus for the press. <laughs> Amen. I'm telling you, brother, the press comes between us and God. You know what media means? You know what media, media, me, media like Mediterranean, Mediterranean, the middle sea, uh, uh, Mesopotamia in the meso, the middle, middle of a thing, in between, mediator, in between. So here's Jesus, here's the media, and here's us. The news media's job is to stop you from seeing Jesus Christ. And you can preach it that way. If you preach that the modern definition of press, it's right. And if you preach it the old definition of press, it's right. The Word of God is not bound. And you ain't doing one thing wrong by saying the press comes between us and the Lord. Amen. Amen. I don't think anybody that's balanced and, and is going to get and are smart at all uh, would, would disagree with that uh, because of the print press. Now listen, uh, the press is, is, uh, is the enemy of God and the Bible. Their job is to keep us from seeing that they don't know that, uh, but that's their job. That's what the devil has called the press to do, uh, cloud, cloud the issues so you can't see the Lord. Their job is they go to school. When they go to school to be trained to be uh, in the news media, they train them. They say, now you can't say this, and you can't say that, and you can't say this, and you can't say that. And the press's job is to say what they believe is politi politically correct and be between us. Don't ever forget, friends, Karl Marx was not a bricklayer. Karl Marx was not a... a uh, uh, a hard laborer. Karl Marx was a journalist. Don't ever forget that. That's why they say he that controls the media controls the country. The media has more power than anybody. I'll tell you why. Because they shape the way we think. Now listen. You hear this stuff? And I'll move on a minute. But I'm, I'm going to talk about the media for a minute. Since we're on it, let's just talk about it uh, for a minute. Uh, they say, uh, this poll has come out, this poll has come out, and, and let, me, let me tell you how them polls can do. I can make my own polls and make it say anything I want. Here's the way it goes. I go back into teenage class this Sunday, 
And I go in there and I say, listen, y'all, have y'all heard that there's more squirrels this year than they've ever been before? And then I'm going to take a whole lesson on it. And then the next week I take a guest on that. And I say, my guest today says that there's more squirrels this year than ever before. And I do that three or four Sundays in a row. Then I go back the next Sunday and say, let's take a poll. How many of you believe there's more squirrels this year than ever before? Well, you know, nine out of ten. There might be one in there that can think for their self. But the big majority are just going to say what they've been fed. Now, what I'm saying to you is more important than anything you're going to hear in a long time. You, you can't. There's not many people can think for their self anymore. Our generation just thinks what they've been fed. Listen, we don't know if there's more squirrels or less squirrels. All we know is what they tell us. Amen? That's right. And I'm telling you tonight, you don't see the, you don't find the Lord in the news media. You don't find the Lord in, in the press. They come between you and the press. The newsman, the, the weatherman says, there's a 30% chance of rain tomorrow. Everybody says, well, it's going to rain tomorrow. That ain't what he said. And that ain't even right. Everybody say, it's supposed to rain tomorrow. He said there's a 30% chance of rain. Everybody says, it's supposed to rain tomorrow. 30% means 3 out of 10. There's a 3 in 10 chance it'll rain. There's also a 7 in 10 chance it won't. That means it probably won't rain. But if you get on there and say, well, it probably ain't going to rain tomorrow. Get on there and say, 70% chance of sunshine tomorrow. The more negative you sound, the more people watch it. And I'm not knocking the weatherman. Bless their heart, they do the best they can, I reckon. I'm just using that for an example. Don't, I don't mean any harm with that. But their, their mentality is major on the negative and what? Oh, it's going to rain tomorrow. And it's, oh, it's going to rain tomorrow. It's going to rain every day this week. 10% Wednesday, 10% change Tuesday. I, I don't have to go to work. If there's a 10% change of rain, get your boots on, get your sorry hide out of bed and go to work. 90% change they won't. Amen. That's right, brother. I'm telling you, the media shape, that they shape the way people think and then they report. Uh, tolerance means this. Tolerance in the news media means we, you be tolerant of us until we get in power, and they were not going to be tolerant of you. That's what that means. Before communism took over a country, you were allowed to say that God was good, but you can't say the devil's bad. You, you practice tolerance until they get in power, and then it's intolerance. You, you, they want us to tolerate their junk, but they're living. I'm going to tell you something tonight. Are you listening to me tonight? This world is not our friend. This world's not the friend of the church. This world's not the friend of the Bible. This not, world's not the friend. Don't try to chum up with them. I know preachers that every time they do something at the church, they call the paper and say, don't you want to put this in the paper? Don't you want to put this in the paper? I tell you, you better watch fooling them around like that. They're led by the devil. They'll come back and hang you one of these days. I'm telling you tonight, ladies and gentlemen, the press stop them from seeing the Lord. Amen. I've, I've seen where a group just in town does something for 15 kids and they'll put an article in the paper about it. These people done something wonderful for these kids at Christmas. We buy pizza for 100 every Sunday. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want me in the paper. Don't call them. But they don't report that. If one preacher messes up, it's all over the news. It's every day. It's every channel. Preach it on that. Preach it on that. They never report on the 10,000 that's out there preaching the word, drawing a modest salary, living in a modest home, living a modest lifestyle, faithful to his family and his wife, and pays his bills. Never. Because their job is to prevent you from seeing the truth. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Give you a little example. And I'm not. I'm not politicking at all. One side of the news media believes Donald Trump can do no wrong. 
It don't matter what he does. We're behind him and behind him. Da, 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 da. We're behind him, brother, behind him, behind him. And the other side of the news media, which is about 85%, believes he can't do nothing right. So they're determined to get rid of him. Those sides determined to keep him. And guess what? They're both wrong. They're both wrong. I said they're both wrong. Amen. I'm telling you, brother, if Donald Trump come out with a cure for cancer, they'd say, no, no, we wish this hadn't happened. 85% of the news media would. They hate his guts. Now, that don't tell you something. I ain't telling you to vote for you. You can write in Miss Desi for president. I don't care. You vote for whoever God tells you to. She'd do better than some we've had. <laughs> Amen. I, I, I don't, I'm not telling you to vote for her, and I'm not politicking. I'm simply making an illustration. If you get upset when somebody brags on him, there's something wrong with you. You're prejudiced. And if you get mad when somebody criticizes it, there's something wrong with you. You ought to be interested in the truth. You ought to be interested in what's right. I mean, where he tries to keep illegal drug addicts out of here, praise God, hallelujah. Where he tries to do something, right, praise God, hallelujah. Where he cusses and where he causes division and where he makes unnecessary fight, no, he's wrong. Now, the media will keep you from seeing that. You know, when Obama was my president, people say, he's not my president. Well, if you live in America, he is. I hate to break it to you, cry baby. You're too immature to be, you're just too immature. When Obama was my president, he done some things that was right. I helped love poor people, he, he, done, some things, but he done some things that was bad. I was for him what he done right, I was against what he done wrong. That's what a Christian's supposed to do. But the news media will keep you from doing that. You know what they talk about tolerance? I would fight for their right to say I'm a devil. I would go to court and testify and say, give them the right to call me the devil if they want to call me that. This is America. We're supposed to be able to believe and say whatever we feel is right. You don't legislate righteousness. You don't make people do this or do that against their conscience. But the day will come when they'll shut our mouth, buddy. They'll shut our mouth. We'll probably be shocked when that day comes. Amen. When they kill that ice easily, I, I was glad when Obama and them got bin Laden. Praise God for the victory. Amen. Amen. When he said the Koran was holy, I said, that, you're wrong. And if you can't do that, it's because you're, you're, you're blinded by your prejudices or your preconceived notions or just because you like somebody. Just because you hate somebody don't mean everything they do is wrong. Just because you like somebody don't mean everything they do is right. What's right's right. What's wrong, wrong. Look at here. They killed an ISIS leader the other day. That one of the wickedest men, they said he like second in ISIS power. And the Washington Post said, quote, an austere religious scholar died. That's the news media, buddy. You talk about a slant. An austere religious teacher, leader died. No, you killed a murderer of thousands of people and took them out. Do you know why the Washington Post did that? Because it don't fit their political beliefs and agenda. Listen, people. The, the news don't tell the news no more. It's propaganda. One side trying to get you to vote their way. The other side trying to get you to vote way, their way. All we know is what they tell us. Here's what I've always told you. You see who the world hates and vote for the other person. And that's as close as you can come to being right. Because you don't know none of them. Amen. Amen. Let's move to another one. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 tonight. And I want to show you something here. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. All you young people, be sure and look at this one. We'll move quickly this evening. 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. Look at verse number... Uh, 11, here's an interesting verse. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. 
that little word device. Did you know in the Bible, the word device means a plan, a scheme, a while, a plot, a tactic, a maneuver with a particular aim in mind. That means in the Bible, a device is a trick with an aim in mind. Trick somebody into doing something wrong. The devil's devices. I'm going to make this guy think alcohol is good for him or smoke this dope and it'll make him smarter. Or I'm going to make him think, you know, try this lifestyle. That way. Trick him into doing something wrong. Now that definition has changed. Device today means that thing you got laying in your lap or in your pocket or out there in your car, or in your house. And lo and behold, it turns out either way you preach it, it's still right to say the devil's devices. You, you may disagree with me, but I don't, I don't, think, I don't think any of that stuff's of, of God. Now, a cell phone is just like TV or radio or anything else. You can use it for good or you can use it for bad. It's just like electricity. You can use it for good or you can use it for bad. But I, you ain't going to sit there and tell me that the world is a better place since all these devices come out on us. It's a trick. It's a trick of the devil. I tell you what your device is. Our cell phones, and I got one in yonder somewhere. I don't bring it in here uh, unless I'm going to use it for something. Uh, I, I'll tell you what your cell phone is. I'll tell you what your iPad is. I'll tell you what your computer is. It is a plan and a plot and a maneuver and a, and a, and a tactic to bring the whole world together to one day come under the Antichrist that will run this world one day. It is the means by which we're all connected to each other and eventually it'll be right there in your hand or in your forehead. Amen. So we're not ignorant of his devices. Oh well it didn't mean that. No it didn't but it does now and they're both right. Yeah. Ain't that something? Ain't that something? The word of God is not bound. What a book we've got there. 1611 before there was electricity before there was cars, and we'll get to them in a minute, before there was uh, 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 watches or anything like that, the book said Satan's devices. You better be careful of Satan's devices. Second Timothy chapter 3. We're doing good here. You're doing good. Stay with me. Second Timothy chapter 3. We're going to hit a couple of more bumps. We done hit a bump a minute ago. We hit another couple bumps here we head down the hill 2 Timothy chapter number 3 and look at verse oh I don't know yeah verse 6 there are all these signs of the last days 2 Timothy 3 6 talks about the last days now right before the Lord comes back and look what he says of all things for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers. She got a bunch of silly women sitting around in the house. I didn't write it. My job's to preach it. A bunch of silly women is the subject of this verse. Sitting around in the house, full of sin and full of lust, and it said these people creep. Oh, my goodness. The word creep means here to move slowly. Like a spider, like a rat, like a snake creeping in to avoid being detected. That word there means to slow, listen to me ladies, it means to slowly move in, not fast. Not come in the front door. Slowly move in your house without being detected. Here he comes. And guess what it calls him? A creep. And here we are in 2019. And everybody said, oh, he's a creep. Oh, he's a creep. And it's always the girls that say that. Something a little weird about a boy who says stuff like that. Little, 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 just a tad. But I'm, I'm 
I'm around young people all the time. I go, and I listen, I listen. The whole time I'm on a trip or everything, I'm, I'm furthering my education. And all these girls all the time say, He's creepy. He's creepy. He's creepy. He's creepy. He's creepy. He's creepy. He creeps me out. He creeps me out. He creeps me out. And it's always the girls. And lo and behold, it turns out right anyway. What about that? 1611 put that word creep in there to mess up a girl. My, 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 my. It means poison or corrupt or mess up women. Girls say, well, that guy, he, he creeps me out. Now, I have said some, I mean some, that every time I see him, it's every man, he creeps me out, he creeps me out, he creeps me out, he creeps me out, he creeps me out. And you're just hoping every man wants you is your problem. You're a wicked little sleaze. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, you little brat. Every man that walks by ain't wanting you. Right. Now, everybody, he creeps me out. He creeps me out. Why? You trying to make everybody think you're so beautiful, everybody wants you. You need to get right with God yourself. You ain't that hot, or newspapers will be calling on you. Everybody, oh, he, 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 he's creepy. He's creepy. Well, you better be careful about that. Maybe he is. And there are plenty of them. There are plenty of them. That's why you men, you men ain't got no business saying things suggestive or out of the way to these young girls or old girls either for that matter. Amen? Amen. They can tell it when you're looking at them wrong, when you're flirting with them. They can tell it. So you old pervert, old creep, keep your thoughts to yourself and get right with God. Scary old wicked men looking at them all the time. You see, it's always the women. Isn't it weird that that verse said... It's all the women. I mean, you know, I've never heard a boy say, she creeps me out. <laughs> you just say, she's ugly. You know? yeah. All right, here we go. Here we go. James chapter 2. We're headed down the other side now. This is a big bump right here, though. James chapter number 2. You talk about verse words in the Bible. Lord, the word of God's not bound. Meant something then, means something else now, and both of them turns out right. James chapter 2, and look at verse number 2. For if there come into your assembly, 1611 people, a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, dressed real nice, and come in a poor man in vile raiment, verse 3, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing. What in the world are we reading? I'm, I'm scared that thing gets around and walks around at night when I'm asleep. I think, it's, I think it moves around by itself. It's alive. It's alive. Said that, we'll finish that verse in a minute. Said a guy was standing on the street corner one day and he had his hat laying there like that. And he said, it's alive, it's alive, it's alive. And people stopped and they said, what? And he pulled his hat and he said, the word of God. That's true. It's alive. Oh, my goodness, the gay clothing. And say unto him, sit here in a good place, say the poor stand out here, sit there. And everybody's read that, everybody's preached on that. Now, obvious, what a, is, you think it's an accident that they put that in the Bible in 1611? I don't. I bet you a new version probably changed that word. Mm -mm -mm. So, what it's saying is, here's a man comes in back then, everybody just wore old plain clothing, old, old, you know, like you're wearing a Christmas play, uh, like that, and then this guy comes in, he's got on a gold ring and awful nice clothes, and they said, uh, he wears the gay clothing. Now, they didn't mean homosexual. That didn't mean homosexual. But you can't even read it without thinking that. I was, a preacher, I was a camp meeting one time. This preacher got up and he said, uh, you know, the real meaning of the word gay is happy and lighthearted. That was the real meaning to start with, you know, and happy, uh, excited, you know, happy and light, and, get, and happy and happy and happy. And he said, so we're all gay. And we was going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He said, yes, we're all gay. Say it. And we said, I ain't saying it. 
And it's because our, men, our mentality, we, we've, we've completely, you see how, you see how the meaning of a word can change? And now it don't mean happy or lighthearted. It means homosexual. And the Bible, the Bible word is sodomite. And it is, a, it is an abomination to God. It's a filthy lifestyle, according to the Bible. It made the land vomit out its inhabitants. And God burned Sodom and Gomorrah to the ground. Nothing against anybody. We don't hate nobody. But lo and behold, it turns out right now to the gay clothing. And to this, to this day, Liberace. You ever seen how he dressed? That was a long time ago too, buddy. You ever seen how they're making the boys dress now? Their pants are tight. This right here, that's how tight your pants are. Kind of like that right there. And boys wearing makeup. Boys putting on eye shadow. Boys getting their nails done. And then the girls, I seen them in Walmart come there and their hair is short as mine and got cargo pants on and walk with their hands in their pocket like this right here. The gay clothing. It's right either way, buddy. <laughs> it's right either way. That's why we teach our kids, a little boy should be a little boy, a little girl should be a little girl. Celine Dion, have y'all heard about her new clothing line? Two or three people in the church sent it to me. I forgot who all, was it you, Pat, that sent me? You said, uh, some, who else? Who sent me that? Somebody sent it to me. Two or three people sent it to me. Celine Dion, she's some kind of a something. Oh, what is she, an actor or a singer or something? Scared to tell me, ain't you? I would be too. You ought to be ashamed. Uh, but she's, she's famous, and, uh, and she, she's come out with this new clothing line. Check it out. And it's got goat horns, pentagrams, and it uh, uh, blends the genders so that boys and girls, there's no difference in boys and girls' clothing anymore. Don't you think it's weird that in our generation, the way sometimes people that are homosexual are recognized is by their clothes? Listen, 200 years ago, all of us would have looked a little sissy, dressing like this right here. And people didn't have nothing. And make sure you keep it masculine. And make sure you keep a girl feminine. Did you know tonight that what about that, the gay clothing you think that's in the Bible by accident boy George Caitlin Bruce cargo shorts for the girls the word of God is not bound it didn't mean that to start with but you can apply it now and still not do no damage to scripture and it's still right now, I'm, I'm going to have to quit, but these I'm going to give as honorable mention. I'll not turn to all of these, but I'm going to give these honorable mention. You write these down and study them when you get home. All you folks that listen on the, on the Internet and all, watch, listen to these and, uh, uh, and, and write these down and study them. The word alien, the word alien is in the Bible in Lamentations 5.2. And it's in Hebrews 11, 30, 34. And it said they put to flight the armies of the aliens. Now when that was written, he was talking about people from other countries. And the original meaning of the word alien does mean foreigner. Somebody from, we used to say somebody from off. Where's he from? He's from off. <laughs> that means he ain't from around here. Well, they're from off. Uh, and and uh, somebody from way off in another country, and they're not from here. Now, since the 70s and the E.T. movie come out, somebody tell me what aliens mean nowadays. Extraterrestrials. Somebody from out of this world, inter, interplanetary, and from another planet. And lo and behold, it turns out that we're still, 
Let's check out Lamentations 5, 2. Hebrews 11, 34, when you get home, and there will be aliens of armies and aliens, and there will be during the great tribulation a mixture of superpower. These are not people from other planets. These are demonic spirits, humanoids that are half man, half machine, and a mixture of iron and clay. What it said in Daniel, on his dream, he said them toes was mixed iron and clay. That means iron is machine and clay and clay is us and you mix a machine and a man and there are people coming on this earth and may already be that are part machine and part human and it matches the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6 the aliens isn't that something that the King James Bible talks to us about armies of aliens and there wasn't even no such thing as a belief of that when this was wrote. That's some book right there. They changed that in the New Bible too. Call, took it out and put foreigners in. Who do you think might have wanted that word alien out of there? Devil. Here's another honorable mention. Nahum 2, Nahum, the book of Nahum, chapter 2 and verse 4, write it down. Is not directly referring to automobiles. There were no automobiles then, but the prophecy says they'll run to and fro and jostle one another against another in the broad ways and seem like torches and run like lightning. I-95, going down through, down through Jacksonville. It didn't mean that then. It's a sure meaning now. Jeremiah chapter 10, the Christmas tree. Chapter, three, chapter 10, verse 3 through 5. Verse 3 through 5. Now, we know that don't mean a Christmas tree. We know when he wrote that, he wasn't talking about a Christmas tree. There wasn't no such thing as a Christmas tree back then. There wasn't no such thing as Christmas back then. Jesus hadn't even come uh, the first time when that was written. And it talks about people going out in the woods and cutting a tree down and decking it with silver and gold and putting it in. And lo and behold, when somebody says, what do you think about a Christmas tree? It answers our question, and it said, don't be afraid of them because they can't do good or evil. But that wasn't talking about a Christmas tree. But it can now and is right. It wasn't then. Ain't that something? Maybe that don't mean a lot to y'all. Stuff like that I see in the Bible all the time, it's just like, whoa, this is God's book. You can cut a tree and deck it with silver and gold like that right there. And it can't hurt you, and it can't help you. It's neutral. I know people, preachers that preach against having Christmas tree and have the internet. <laughs> That's the biggest life I've had in a long time. A Christmas tree's wicked. A Christmas tree's wicked. Yeah, did, the internet is clean. You are the biggest hypocrite. I, we'll get, every time we put that wreath up there, I get, we get letters every year. Oh, you, you heathen, you pagan, you pagan. You're the pagan, buddy. You're on that YouTube watching us. You're the pagan. You support, you support the world where one out of four websites is pornography and pay them money every month to support it. You hypocrite. That's what I've heard. And I'm going to tell you something tonight. Your preacher, you ain't, your preacher ain't perfect, but I don't look at pornography. I don't look at it. I'm not saying I ain't never seen it because I have. Way, it's been years. But I don't look at that stuff. Amen. You don't have to worry about Brother Danny looking at pornography. I don't look at it. If something pops up on my phone, by the grace of God that's questionable, I just do like this, turn my head and get rid of it. By the grace of God, I ain't bragging on me. Only by the grace of God. And if you let that stuff, you boys listen to me tonight, that stuff will ruin you. It will mess you up. And if you ever do get a wife, you ain't even going to be able to be happy with her because that stuff's perverted your mind. You better stay away from it. It ain't harmless. It ain't harmless. You men here, you creeps here tonight, you old creepy old men better leave that stuff alone. I'm telling you, you better. You better, oh, I just look at it once in a while, preacher. Everybody does. No, everybody don't. No, everybody don't.
will and you don't have to. God told me one time, he said, well, you need a little something to spice up your love life. No, you, that'll ruin your love life. Well, what about Acts chapter 19, verse 29, 30, and 31, where Paul was getting ready to go in a theater. That's what it said. And the disciples told him not to and wouldn't let him. Ain't that something? 1611, before TV is ever invented. Paul was going into the theater. And the disciples said, no, Paul, don't go in there. No, no, don't do it. You ain't been saved long, brother. That'll mess you up. And he said, well, you're a Pharisee, ain't you? You got too many convictions. No, don't go in the theater. And lo and behold, the same's true now. If you'll listen to the Lord and a real disciple, they'll tell you not to go to the theater. Old country preacher can get up and preach that about going to the movies and be absolutely correct. Don't everybody shout all at the same time. You got enough stuff to worry about without watching. You say, well, I, we don't watch dirty movies. You just are. Our movies are dirty. They're dirty. And you know they are. You know they are. All right, I'm done. I could talk about Matthew 16, 27, 28. For the second coming of Jesus, and then six days later, it gives a double meaning to that scripture. I could talk about Jesus looked at Peter one time, and he said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. He's talking to the devil through Peter. A lot of time, like in, in Matthew 24, when it's talking about one stone shall not be left upon another, and a lot of the old the, the backslid liberal professors have made all that stuff about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. And it did talk about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., but it goes forward up in the tribulation because some of that stuff ain't even happened yet. So it's double. It's double meaning. It meant then, and it meant what's coming in the future. See, the sun and the moon didn't turn to blood when Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 A.D. Jesus didn't come back when Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 A.D. It did mean that, but it meant something else too. That's why the worst class you can possibly take when you go to college is a course on religion. Because they put all that stuff historical and none of it spiritual and make you think it's all in the past if it even did happen. Okay, I'm done. The Word of God is not bound. Let's stand. Amen. We'll bow our heads and have a little word of prayer here and you can go.